We're going to read verses 1 through 30. After this, the Moabites and Ammonites, and with them some of the Minuites, came against Jehoshaphat for battle. Some men came and told Jehoshaphat, A great multitude is coming against you from Edom and from beyond the sea. And behold, they are at Hazan Tamar, that is, En Gedi. Then Jehoshaphat was afraid and set his face to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. And Judah assembled to seek help from the Lord. From all the cities of Judah they came to seek the Lord. And Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah in Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, O Lord, God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. In your hand are power and might, so that none is able to withstand you. Did you not, our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel, and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? And they have lived in it and have built for you in it a sanctuary for your name, saying, If disaster comes upon us, the sword, judgment, or pestilence, or famine, we will stand before this house and before you, for your name is in this house, and cry out to you in our affliction, and you will hear and save. And now behold, the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom you would not let Israel invade when they came from the land of Egypt, and whom they avoided and did not destroy, behold, they reward us by coming to drive us out of your possession, which you have given us to inherit. O our God, you will, not execute, will you not execute judgment on them? For we are powerless against this great horde that is coming against us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Meanwhile, all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives, and their children. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehazel, son of Zechariah, son of Benaniah, son of Jael, son of Mataniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph, in the midst of the assembly. And he said, Listen, all Judah, inhabitants of Jerusalem, and King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, Do not be afraid, do not be dismayed at this great horde, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow go down against them. Behold, they will come up by the ascent of Ziz. You will find them at the end of the valley, east of the wilderness of Jeruel. You will not need to fight in this battle. Stand firm, hold your position, and see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid and do not be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, and the Lord will be with you. Then Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell down before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. And the Levites of the Korathites and the Korites stood up to praise the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud voice. And they rose early in the morning and went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. And when they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you will be established. Believe his prophets, and you will succeed. And when he had taken counsel with the people, he appointed those who were to sing to the Lord and praise him in holy attire, as they went before the army and said, Give thanks to the Lord, for His steadfast love endures forever. And when they began to sing and praise, the Lord set an ambush against the men of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, so that they were routed. For the men of Ammon and Moab rose against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, devoting them to destruction. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, they all helped destroy one another. When Judah came to the watchtower of the wilderness, they looked toward the horde, and behold, there were dead bodies lying on the ground. None had escaped. When Jehoshaphat and his people came to take their spoil, they found among them in great numbers goods, clothing, and precious things, which they took for themselves until they could carry no more. They were there three days in taking the spoil. It was so much. On the fourth day, they assembled in the valley of Barakah, where there they blessed the Lord. Therefore, the name of that place has been called the valley of Barakah to this day. When they returned, every man of Judah and Jerusalem, and Jehoshaphat at their head, returning to Jerusalem with joy, 
but the Lord had made them rejoice over their enemies. They came to Jerusalem with harps and lyres and trumpets to the house of the Lord, and the fear of the Lord came upon all the kingdoms of the countries when they heard that the Lord had fought against the enemies of Israel. So the realm of Jehoshaphat was quiet, for his God gave him rest all around. Starting a new sermon series today. In the Old Testament, leadership was by prophets, priests, and kings. If you read the Old Testament, most of the stories surround these three roles, either prophets or priests or kings, and these are the ones who led Israel and guided Israel, provided that leadership. You'll notice on the cover of your bulletins here, if you take them out, we have prophets, which are represented by the uh, scroll here, priests, which is represented by the cross, like Christ's sacrifice on the cross, priests made the sacrifices, and then a crown for, for kings. So prophets, priests, and kings. And then, this is not just irrelevant to us because Jesus, when He came, was the ultimate prophet and priest and king. He was the fulfillment or the ultimate of each one. So if you would uh, answer this question here with me, why is He called Christ, meaning anointed? Because he has been ordained by God the Father and has been anointed with the Holy Spirit to be our chief prophet and teacher who perfectly reveals to us the secret counsel and will of God for our deliverance. Our only high priest who has set us free by the one sacrifice of his body and who continually pleads our cause with the Father and our eternal King, who governs us by His Word and Spirit, and who guards us and keeps us in the freedom He has won for us. So Christ fulfills all of those roles. He is our prophet and priest and king. But it doesn't end there, actually. As Christians, we are prophets and priests and kings. Because we are Christians, we share in His anointing. So we are prophets and priests and kings. So let's answer this question together. Why are you called a Christian? Because by faith I am a member of Christ, and so I share in His anointing. I am anointed to confess His name, to present myself to Him as a living sacrifice of thanks to strive with a good conscience against sin and the devil in this life, and afterward to reign with Christ over all creation for all eternity. So, we share in His anointing as a prophet and priest and king. We are prophets in that we confess His name. We are priests in that we present ourselves to Him as living sacrifices of thanks. And we are kings in that we strive with a good conscience against sin and the devil, and then afterward to reign with Christ over all creation. So we are prophets and priests and kings. As we look at the old covenant prophets, priests, and kings, we have a better idea about what that meant as Christ is the ultimate fulfillment of that, as well as how we are prophets, priests, and kings too. Now God has given... Us, wealth, property, possessions, influence, children, employees, perhaps, to oversee. So we have, we have this general dominion, but this is kind of a general dominion. This is not particular to Christ or even Christians, necessarily. Jesus didn't have wealth, property, possessions, children, or employees, or very little to speak of, anyway. And yet, he was the king. He was the ultimate king. So, the wealth and the property, the possessions, that doesn't make us a king in the Christian sense. Christ is king by overcoming Satan and sin. Or at least that is one key aspect of his being a king. He overcame Satan and sin, our chief enemies in this world. 
So, his kingdom is not of this world, as he said boldly to Pilate. And so, he doesn't need to have an army to defend himself. He goes willingly to the cross, even though he is a king. His kingdom is not of this world. And believers, if you are a believer, believers are kings by following the king of kings. And as we share in his anointing, we ourselves rule and overcome Satan and sin even as he did. So we reject the rule of this world and Satan's threats because we are not under their command. We reject the commands of sin. We reject the demands of this world and its influences. We respect the rulers and the authorities over us, of course, because God put them there. But they don't own us. They don't own us. If ever they ask us to do something that goes against what God says, we disobey them. And without hesitation. Because we are owned, we belong to the Lord. We don't belong to the rulers or the authorities that we have here and now. Alright, so this story here. The story of Jehoshaphat, who was a king over Judah, the southern kingdom. This story focuses on how Jehoshaphat mostly conducts himself as a king here. It talks about the people as well. It does mention a battle, but the focus of the story is how Jehoshaphat conducts himself as a king. And I want to point out a few things in this story here. Verse 3 is a key verse. I'm going to read it one more time. Then Jehoshaphat was afraid and set his face to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. In the time of trouble, Jehoshaphat sought the Lord. If you read through the book of Chronicles, one key theme that you will see again and again is that the people who are of faith and believe seek the Lord. And so here we have a a code word for saying Jehoshaphat was a good man. He was a believer in the Lord and he sought the Lord. And there's a lot of other stories in Chronicles running similar to that. Now, it should be noted that this chapter 20 here picks up in the middle of Jehoshaphat's reign. If you go to the beginning, which is your Bible reading track for today, Jehoshaphat doesn't seek God only in trouble, but as a whole life pattern. He's not just seeking God when he has to because there's something bigger than him out there. He's seeking God in his whole life. And so, he's not just seeking God just now, just suddenly. He's seeking the Lord in times of trouble and in good times as well. In 2 Chronicles 17, it says, The Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he walked in the earlier ways of his father David. He did not seek the Baals, the false gods, but sought the God of his father and walked in his commandments and not according to the practices of Israel. Therefore, the Lord established the kingdom in his hand. And all Judah brought tribute to Jehoshaphat, and he had great riches and honor. In Chronicles, people who seek the Lord and follow him and do right by him are the ones who are rewarded. The ones who turn away from God, the ones who seek other gods, those are the ones who have major problems and calamities, catastrophes. I don't know if you noticed this when we were reading through it, The fighting gets two verses. The prayer gets seven. The chapter here spends a whole lot more time talking about the prayer that Jehoshaphat prayed and only a couple verses to the the action. You know? If you're you're watching an action movie, sometimes they'll, they'll slow down and go through slow motions, some of the car chases or some of the crashes or the explosions or something like that. You know, we we like to highlight the action. Here, the real action is the prayer. That's where the real power is. Fighting just gets two verses. Our most powerful defense is prayer. That's our most powerful defense. 
It might not be dazzling to the eyes, like an explosion or a car chase or anything like that, but that is the most powerful weapon at our disposal. That's where the action really happens. In uh, martial arts class, we always begin class with prayer, and we always end the class with prayer, because as good as it is to train ourselves how to defend ourselves, how to, how to fight when we absolutely need to, our biggest defense, our surest stronghold is the Lord and not our own strength and not our own abilities and techniques. So we begin with prayer. Whoever's leading class always begins with prayer. And then we always end with prayer. And I always ask a student to pray, a student volunteer. Because, again, the most important defense that we have is prayer. And there's a reason for that. Our true enemies in this world, in this life, are not North Korea or ISIS. It's not heart disease. It's not cancer. It's not obesity. It's not Republicans or Democrats. Our true enemies are Satan and sin. Those are our enemies. We get caught up in the enemies that we can see, the ones that are right in front of us, the ones that are the ones that get our attention usually, but really our enemies are the ones we can't see. Jehoshaphat faced an army that was much greater than him. There was a, a coalition of, of three groups of people that was against him. And so he was afraid when this army came against him because he was up against an, an opposition that was much greater. Sin and Satan are greater than us, but not greater than the one within us. That needs to be stressed. Satan is more powerful than us. He's smarter than us. He's been around since the beginning, so he knows a lot. He can work behind the scenes so that we don't even know what he's doing or where he is or how he's accomplishing it. He's stronger than us. That, that's evident. Sin is stronger than us. It, it, uh, it knows how to manipulate us. We have our own passions and desires and inclinations. And sometimes, in fact, usually the sins that overtake us are the ones that we tend to think are not so bad. The ones that we try to excuse, the ones we try to justify, and they, it gets the best of us. 1 John 4, verse 4. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Our God is greater. In Luke 10, Jesus sent out 72 and told them to go preach and teach, as well as to heal people and, and drive out demons. And when the 72 came back, they came back with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. So we are kings in this world with God-given authority. We are deputized as kings. In our story here, I don't know if you noticed this, but they go out to meet the enemy and they are worshiping and giving thanks even before they meet the enemy. They praise, they give thanks at just the promise of victory. So the Spirit comes upon this one guy who is a, a Levite and he proclaims that you will be delivered. And just at that, just at that promise, everybody gives thanks. And they praise and they worship. Satan and sin still oppress us now. 
They still give us lots of hardship, lots of trouble, lots of problems, for sure. But we have a promise of victory over them. We have a promise that one day they will be gone forever. They will be eternally defeated and that they will be gone forever. We don't see that right now. They are, they are defeated. Christ defeated them on the cross. But we don't, we don't have our final victory just yet. That's coming though. It's coming for sure. And so, even though Satan and sin still give us problems and trouble, we praise and worship even before the final victory, just like they did. They hadn't even won yet, and they were praising God and worshiping and giving thanks. So we praise and worship, even today. Maybe you're here today, and there's a lot that's going wrong in your life right now. Maybe there's a lot that you're worried about, a lot that has you stressed. Maybe Satan and sin are really getting the best of you right now. Even so, even if you are at your lowest of your lowest point in your life right now, this is still the right place to be. Because we have a promise of final victory, and just on that promise, we worship the Lord. We give Him thanks. Because we know that whatever is going on right now is only temporary. We have a final victory, and because of that, we praise and worship. It is always appropriate to worship the Lord. No matter how good things may be, no matter how bad things may be, it's always appropriate because of that final victory that we will have. So I hope that even in your lowest moments of your life, that you will still always worship the Lord and give thanks. Jehoshaphat was a godly king. It's pretty clear in, about that in Scripture. He was, he was a godly man. He sought the Lord, but he still had some big problems. And this was one of them. Being godly doesn't mean that you're not afraid. It says he was afraid, and so he sought the Lord. And he even says, we are powerless against this great horde that is coming against us. We do not know what to do. In his prayer, that's what he says to the Lord. We don't know what to do. We are at a loss. We, we got nothing. Lord, we're, we're looking to you. We have nothing. So major problems can come upon even the godly. You might be a godly person. And I look out there, I know many of you are. But even if you are one of the most godly people on earth... That doesn't mean you're not going to have any problems. There's going to be problems. Jehoshaphat was a godly king and he still had problems. Being a Christian doesn't keep us from problems. It doesn't keep us from opposition. It doesn't keep us from persecution or disasters. Being a Christian does not give you immunity to those things. Being a Christian means we are right with God and have heavenly confidence even in earthly disaster. We have a confidence in a Lord, and that confidence cannot be shaken. It doesn't matter how bad things get here. If everything that could possibly go wrong would go wrong, we still have a heavenly confidence that cannot be taken away from us. Because we have a God that cannot be taken away from us. We have a salvation that cannot be taken from us. And I hope that however bad it might get in your life, that you would find that confidence. Our kingdom is not of this world either. So even if for some reason the United States would collapse and we would lose this country that we enjoy, we celebrate this country this week, let's say we lose it tomorrow. It's gone. It's, It's part of history now. I don't know how, but let's say it would. It's a kingdom of this earth, just like all the others, and so it can fall. Let's say it did. Even if it did, we have a heavenly kingdom that cannot be shaken, that will never fall. If we lost everything that we had, all of our possessions, everything, even if we did, Our treasure is not in banks or possessions, 
deeds of love and mercy are what are eternal gold to us. If you're a Christian, that is true of you. If we lose our life, and we will lose our life someday, life is not a beating heart and brain waves. If you're a Christian, life is belonging to and knowing and following Jesus Christ. That's what real life is. So if you're a Christian, you look at the world very differently. And you have a confidence that cannot be shaken. An unbeliever's problems will be his downfall, but a believer's problems will be his deliverance. If you have a heavenly confidence that cannot be shaken, then no matter what happens to you, this will turn out for your deliverance, as hard as it might be to believe at this moment, we have that promise that God will take even the worst things that we have and they will, He will use them for our deliverance. A believer's problems, the problems in our life, will actually draw us nearer to the Lord. They will actually build us in faith. They will actually strengthen our resolve. But unbelievers will be brought down by their problems. They'll be destroyed by them. They'll be consumed by them. They'll be made bitter by them. If you're a believer, your problems will actually make you better. If you're a believer, then you are a king. You are a deputized king by the heavenly king. And so, you can go into this week and you can rule. You can share that rule that he has given to you. But your role is not of his king is not like the kingdoms of this world. It's a different kind of being a king. As a king, your role, just like Jehoshaphat here, your role is to praise and worship. That is your role as a king. That is your most important duty as a king, to praise the Lord and to worship him. Jehoshaphat did even when an army was coming against him. That was his first duty. So whether things are going well or whether things are not, praising and worshiping the Lord is your first duty as a king. As you go in your rule, the rule that God gives you, praise and worship. Make sure that you are devoted to prayer, that you have your devotion time. Make sure that you remember the Lord throughout the day and give Him thanks whenever you enjoy something that He gives to you. You are a king insofar as you follow the king of kings. The closer you follow him, the more you follow him, the more you will be a king like him. Because as a Christian, you share in his anointing as a king. And the closer you get, the more you share in his rule. We'll talk more about being a king in this coming sermon series. But that's enough for today. Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord our God, as believers you have made us kings who share in your anointing. We give you thanks, Lord. But help us to see that we are a king in a different way than, than the kingdoms of this world. So that, Lord, we have treasure and confidence and life that is unseen. One that comes from you. So Lord, draw us to you. Show us, Lord, what it means to rule as you rule. And to love as you love. And we pray that we would always praise and worship as kings in this world. In Jesus' name, amen.